Our sun provides us with the light and heat we need to keep warm and grow the crops we need to survive. It makes possible the very existence of life on this planet. It is the ultimate battery that drives our climate and our energy needs. And, like an electric current, its overload can plunge us into darkness. On Friday, March 10th, a powerful explosion on the sun launched a cloud of gas from active region 5395, a sunspot group nearly dead center on the sun and over three Earths in diameter. The storm cloud rushed out from the sun at a million miles an hour, and on the evening of Monday, March the 12th, it struck Earth's magnetic field. Millions of people in Alaska, Canada, and Scandinavia were treated to a spectacular auroral display that night that lasted from sunset until midnight. A spectacular light show took the skies as far south as Florida and Cuba. The vast majority of people in the Northern Hemisphere had never seen such a spectacle in recent times. Some even worried that a nuclear first strike might be in progress. Silently, the storm had impacted the magnetic field of the Earth and caused continent-wide electrical currents to flow in the ground. The expanding ring of storm currents created by the northern lights swooped downwards in latitude deep into North America. This caused continent-wide electrical currents to flow in the ground beneath the gawker's feet. The currents eventually found harbor in the electrical systems of the United Kingdom, the United States, and Canada. At 2.44.16 a.m. on March 13th, all was well as power engineers operated the Hydro-Quebec power grid. They had resigned themselves to yet another night of watching power loads come and go during the off-peak hours. The engineers didn't know, however, that for the last half hour, their entire system had been under attack by powerful earth currents. A power grid consists of hundreds of electrical generation plants, thousands of transformers that boost the voltages to send the current along transmission lines, tens of thousands of substations that step down the voltages, and millions of power poles that serve to connect the substations to the customers. This entire network must be maintained or regulated to a fixed voltage so that the power is moved efficiently. The large transformers are grounded to the earth and this provides a pathway for magnetic storm earth currents to enter the network. If the storm is strong enough, the network loses its regulation and this can cause damage to costly transformers that take weeks to repair or even years to replace. Since magnetic storms cover millions of square kilometers, entire power grids can be shut down, causing major blackouts. At 2.44.17 a.m., these currents found a weak spot in a sprawling North American power grid located in Quebec. A 100-ton static VAR capacitor, number 12, at the Shibugamo substation tripped and went offline as harmonic currents caused protective relays to sense overload conditions. At 2.44.19 a.m., two seconds later, the loss of voltage regulation at Shibugamo caused power swings and a reduction of power generation in the 735,000 volt Lagrande transmission network. At 2.44.46 a.m. and 150 kilometers away at the Albanel and the Miskau stations, four more capacitors went offline. The last station to fall at 2.45.16 a.m. was the Lavarendri complex to the south of Shipogamo. The fate of the network had been sealed in barely 59 seconds as the entire 9,460 megawatt output from Hydro-Quebec's La Grande Hydroelectric Complex found itself without proper regulation. Lasting 75 seconds from start to finish, the cascading events traveled much too fast in space and time for human operators to react. But it was more than enough time for 21 billion watts of badly needed electrical power to suddenly disappear from service. The nighttime temperature in Toronto was 19 degrees Fahrenheit, 
or minus 7 degrees Celsius. So the loss of electric power was felt very dramatically as most people woke up to cold homes for breakfast. Over 3 million people live near Montreal, the second largest metropolitan area in Canada, where nearly half the population of Quebec resides. Montreal is famous for its 30 kilometers of underground walkways linking 60 buildings, two universities, and thousands of shops and businesses. Over 500,000 people use this system each day to avoid the freezing cold winter air. Pedestrians suddenly found themselves plunged into complete darkness with only the feeble battery-powered safety lights to guide them to the surface. The presses at the Montreal Gazette had been rolling at breakneck speed that night to print the Monday newspaper for its 195,000 subscribers. The sudden loss of power caused the huge rolls of paper, each weighing several tons, to come to a sudden halt, shredding paper in a storm of debris and jamming the presses. The blackout also closed schools and businesses, kept the Montreal Metro shut down during the morning rush hour, and paralyzed Dorval Airport, delaying dozens of flights. Without their navigation radar in operation, no flight could land or take off until power had been restored. People ate their cold breakfasts in the dark and left for work. They soon found themselves stuck in congested traffic. Motorists tried to navigate darkened intersections without any street lights or traffic control systems operating. Thanks to working emergency generators, no major problems were reported for most of Montreal's hospitals, although the Montreal Children's Hospital canceled all elective surgery. A more urgent situation did arise at the St. Luke Hospital when four patients in intensive care had to have air pumped into their lungs manually. Like most modern cities, people work round the clock, and in the early morning hours of March 13, the swing shift staffed many office buildings in the caverns of downtown Montreal. All these buildings were now pitch dark, stranding workers in dark offices, stairwells, and elevators. The Quebec blackout cost businesses tens of millions of dollars as it stalled production, idled workers, and spoiled products. By 10 a.m., power had been restored to most of the customers in Quebec, and by 11 a.m. on March 14, all but 3,500 of the 842,000 customers were back in business. Almost immediately, in the daily papers on March 14, the cause was attributed by scientists and engineers to a magnetic storm, and the cause of the blackout switched to an Act of God event for which Hydro-Quebec could not be held entirely responsible. I recently spoke with electric power engineer John Deland at Hydro-Quebec about the 1989 blackout. In the following weeks after the uh, 1989 event, corrective action is to, has been the decision to use uh, space weather forecasting services. Uh, this uh, service will alert the, uh, the operator that uh, something is coming or might be coming with a given probability, a given severity, the, and then the operator can be prepared to uh, take corrective action against uh, the uh, geomagnetic storm. The National Research Council in Ottawa issued a warning to the utility about the impending magnetic storm six days before the event arrived. To its credit, Hydro-Quebec heeded these warnings and recommendations and reduced the power by 10% as a precaution. Yet pointing a finger at the sun was not considered a credible explanation by a population unfamiliar with the effects that solar storms are capable of. Although this historic blackout was largely a local political and economic event for Quebec, it served as a major wake-up call for the United States.